Philosopher John Locke believed that the individual who lives in a society has to relinquish some of his personal freedom in order to keep societal chaos at bay. Indeed, over the centuries, either religions, political cultures, or social norms and conventions outlined a sphere of expected behavior from civilians. In order to preserve the social structure as it is, those who don't answer to the expectations of the social norm have their freedom hindered and narrowed. This freedom is sometimes limited through direct physical and violent control through institutions such as the police, prisons or mental hospitals, but sometimes it is done through more invisible means. Design can take part of these somewhat invisible systems of power and control. As we live in a designed world abundant with consumer products, we wish to delve in this lecture into the relation between designs and their ability to imbue our material surroundings with invisible traits of power, control and violence. The invisibility of these power systems is sustained by the way they forge identities. Objects and environments that we interact with construct a sense of who we are and help us express what we perceive as our personal or collective identity. The construction of identity, however, goes much farther than an expression of who someone is. As French philosopher Louis Althusser suggested, it can be, to some extent, a deliberate attempt by individuals, classes, groups, organizations, governments or nations to create a particular construct or image unconsciously adapted by us, consequently persuading us to willingly participate in power structures and hierarchies that constrain our own freedom and our understanding of the world. Let's consider three norms. First, gender norms. A well-debated example of the ways in which design participates in the creation and reinforcement of cultural norms and power structures can be seen in the design of toys. Gender design is an attitude that separates between boys and girls' toys. Through harmless and naive designed objects, the toys strengthen clear and narrow gender roles. Boys' figures, for example, are usually blue, war-themed, centered on professions, and more action-oriented. Conversely, the girls' figures are pink, focused on the domestic sphere, and centered on themes of care, beauty, and fashion. These designs forge and preserve dangerous norms that limit the ways boys or girls are allowed to imagine their own identities, abilities, and possibilities in the world, according to a hierarchical power structure designation. These kinds of designs are not limited to childhood, but reinforce gender stereotypes also in adult consumers, as we can clearly see in the difference between the gender designs of Dove soaps. Being soap a product generally associated with the domestic space and themes of care and hygiene, thus related to women, Dove created a harder line, square design of soap for men that comes in a darker package with a clear label that emphasizes for men. Accordingly, the regular, no special label, softer design soap is associated with femininity and sometimes even has a pink package. This shows us how stressful can be to challenge gender roles and stereotypes in a strictly gendered society that our manhood could be subverted and undermined just by the simple act of buying a soap or a pink package product. Therefore, design helps us stick to society's expectations from our gender, allowing men to stay strong and tough while still buying soap. Thus, protecting manhood as defined by social norms and preserving the societal power structures that define which aspects of life are accessible to women and which are not. Let's talk about racial norms. A similar case could be made regarding race and ethnic design. When the Spaceship Pioneer 10 was launched, a gold plaque was attached to its outer hull. On it was a diagram of our solar system describing the placement of the Earth relative to the Sun, the most common element in space, hydrogen, and a man and a woman naked. As we can see, the diagram raises several questions in relation to graphic design. Firstly, the man and the woman are clearly depicted as white and probably blonde, although the diagram is monochrome. Secondly, the relation between the position of the man and the position of the woman puts the man in the active and central role. Thirdly, while the men's genitals are clearly depicted, the woman has undergone a quick process of censorship by NASA. And lastly, their position in an outline echoes a Western conception of ideal beauty resonating with classical principles of corporal description and aesthetic reminiscent of da Vinci or traditional ancient Greek or Roman sculpture. This kind of seemingly naive designs strengthen the ideological stance that the most universal and natural being is the white male with a certain kind of body. 
while other identities are specific, not universal, and under him in the hierarchical parallel structure. Therefore, designing identities, as I said, is not just about expressing ourselves, but it is an act that is always already charged with control and power. Following this example, we could focus on the icon of Jesus Christ, how he was portrayed throughout the history of art, and how his figure was finally designed as a white male, while originally he was a person of color, Middle Eastern and Semitic Jew. Meaning that his appearance might have much more in common with the Arabs demonized today by media and by some politicians than with the Caucasian male. Because Jesus is considered a universal symbol and image for purity, goodness, as well as power, having him portrayed and designed as white can be seen as a distortion of history that reinforces very specific ideological connotations, namely, ideas of naturality, universality, purity, goodness, and success are connected with white people, and other ethnic representations are used to signify the diverse, the exotic, the flavored, or a primitive authenticity. To paraphrase philosopher Franz Fanon's famous theories, in Western societies, non-whiteness is perceived as an abnormality and as wrongness. Third, class norms and new urban fortresses. In the last example, we will see how designers, industrial as well as urban, play an active role in redesigning urban public space in order to preserve hierarchies and norms. While private and closed residences have been a part of our lives for many, many years, contemporary designs shroud this with a layer of design barriers almost transparent, making us believe these barriers are almost non-existent. By using very slight elevations, differentiating materials, accentuating the difference between private and public spaces, designers are excluding the city inhabitants and creating closed communities shrouded by design instead of actual fences thus perpetrating through design class differences and hierarchies of power and control. This new and dangerous venue of design renders again the designer as part of a complex system that, while trying to renovate and resist all norms, still acts in itself as part of them. The designer, in this sense, acts as an agent of embedding new behaviors and can be seen as a part of the problem instead of a part of the solution.